me. Well, let me start by welcoming everybody to this evening's webinar on being church through COVID. Uh, I want to acknowledge that I am sitting in my study nook on uh, Darug land in Sydney's western suburbs. And for those of you who know on whose land you sit in Australia, uh, or who are the kind of traditional owners and custodians of land, you might sit wherever you are in the world, uh, might be a good moment to just take a chance to reflect on their ongoing stewardship and care for the land, um, the sovereignty which they have exercised in careful custodianship uh, under God's provision for countless generations. And I acknowledge that I'm a latecomer to this land and pay respect to elders past and present. I also want to thank everyone for making time. Um, this is a, a obviously an important topic of conversation, could be quite a challenging topic of conversation. Um, so the plan yeah. is to have uh, Pastor Ramesh Regmi from Smyrna Church in Nepal Ganj uh, and Pastor Megan Paul de Troyes, uh, from Sydney uh, sharing some personal reflections and some um, sort of church and theological uh, reflections um, and also focusing on what the church at its best can be and what they think we're called to do as we continue to respond. Um, so my name's Ben. I've met probably everyone on the call actually by the looks. Uh, I'm the CEO of INF Australia and it's a real um, privilege and joy to facilitate tonight's workshop. Uh, I'll let Ramesh and Megan introduce themselves except to say I've known Megan online for a, a little while and I've known her in person also for a little while, um, more recent than my knowledge of her online. Um, she's a teacher and a speaker and a writer and a theologian, um, uh, in the, particularly in the Baptist community, with a ministry to the wider Australian Christian community, particularly through um, her writing and a podcast that she runs for Eternity magazine. Uh, and Pastor Ramesh um, is pastor of a church with a long connection with INF uh, in Nepal, in Nepal Ganj, and INF Australia is partnering with um, a community development organisation called Miller, uh, which is effectively the community development organisation birthed by Smyrna Church um, in that part of Nepal. Um, so tonight, the plan for tonight is we'll give you a little bit of an overview. Um, Ramesh will fill us in with where COVID is up to in Nepal. Megan and Ramesh will share a little bit about what it means for them personally, how they as people, as, they, as Christians, uh, members of families, how they have, what, what COVID has meant for them, what impact it's had on them and their communities. Um, we'll have a look at what churches are doing um, and share some stories, hopefully some positive stories there. Uh, and then we'll finish with some reflections on sort of the theological and missiological challenges posed by a global pandemic. What does it mean to be God's people, to be Jesus's people in the world at this time? Um, and there might not be one answer, there might be lots of answers, but how do we um, find, we're following Jesus on the road all the time, right? Um, but sometimes the road takes an interesting turn um, we cross a hill and find ourselves in a valley that we were not expecting to be in. And I guess global pandemic is one such place. So what does it mean to be Jesus's people on the road with Jesus at this time? And I guess that's the critical question for tonight's um, webinar, really. And then there'll be time for questions. So please do um, jot down questions. If you want to note them as we go in the chat, um, you're welcome to use the chat function. I'll try to keep track of that and point back uh, at the end to Ramesh and Megan. Um, but can I just also, um, by way of uh, opening, just acknowledge that it probably for a lot of people on this call, like uh, me, certainly, there's probably a lot of emotion about this topic. Um, this is uh, a disease that has affected pretty much everyone on the face of the planet. Um, I'd be 
surprised if there is anyone on this call who doesn't know someone who has been touched by it in some way, either become sick, lost a family member, uh, or been affected through a lockdown uh, or other sorts of disruptions. It's had an enormous impact. Um, officially, uh, 235 million cases, officially almost 5 million deaths, but that's almost certainly a vast underestimate. They're the official reported statistics. It's not gonna capture number of people who became sick and recovered without being tested or became sick and passed away without ever being tested. Um, it's not going to cover the number of deaths that could have been prevented if health systems and hospitals hadn't been overwhelmed with COVID cases at a given moment. Um, so yeah, the, uh, there are various estimates of the likely excess deaths, but it's, it's probably three times the size of the official statistics. Um, so I just do want to acknowledge it's a it's an emotionally fraught and painful topic. And um, yeah, if you're bearing grief or pain through it, you are not alone. So I hope we'll also end with some time of yeah, just reflection that um, as I wrote in an article in the recent uh, Today in Nepal, um, if we are all in this together, then let's work to make that true, not just a thing that we say, not just some nice sounding words, but actually make it a reality that we work to support each other and look out for each other so that it's true when we say we are all in this together. But enough from me. Um, I was going to ask Ramesh if he could just update us on how things are in Nepal. Um, yeah, just what, what is happening with COVID in Nepal, Ramesh? Uh, thank you very much, Ben. So uh, recently, uh, the current situation is uh, not very bad. Uh, the hospitals are uh, almost EMT, let's say. Very few people, very few uh, people are in the hospital and very less uh, are in the ventilator uh, in intensive care units. But uh, I'm personally suspecting a lot that we are in the uh, uh, very near uh, from the big festival and a lot of Nepali people uh, from India are coming back. So we can see thousands of Nepali people coming back every day uh, through different uh, borders. So this, uh, this flow will uh, make uh, another disaster in Nepal, I, I suspect like that. So currently the situation is uh, okay, uh, schools are open, all the towns, no lockdowns, people are free, but let's, let's pray that nothing will happen after the, after the festival or during the festival. Because Nepal has already been through two major waves, hasn't it? The, the first wave in 2020 and then sort of the, de the wave driven by Delta um, this year. Yes. So uh, the first, first wave was not that much uh, uh, fearful. Uh, that was uh, uh, very, very soon it was controlled. Uh, because of because of lockdowns or uh, people were uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, afraid and they themselves were uh, controlled so the first wave was uh, uh, not that much big problem but the second wave was very big and uh, so i have got uh, some slides uh, that that shows uh, uh, how, how uh, big uh, problem it was. So I would like to share some uh, slides. <clears throat> yes, this is, uh, this is the current uh, statistics. I actually got it from Ministry of, Ministry of Health Affairs. So uh, there were more, more, more than, uh, 
more, more than more than uh, seven million, uh, around uh, uh, eight, eight million. Yes, the, less than one million, but that is uh, in Nepali systems we call it seven lakhs. More, yeah, around eight lakhs people were uh, uh, positive. But as Ben already said, there are a lot of people who were uh, untested. So this is official data, and then uh, eleven thousand one hundred forty-eight people uh, uh, died until today. So, uh, 898 new cases in last 24, year, 24 hours, and 16,804 people are in isolation now, and 250 people are in quarantine. These people are actually coming from, uh, from uh, foreign land uh, through Tribhuvan International Airport. So these people are in quarantine, but on official uh, border points, there are, uh, a lot, a lot of border points. So there are so many people uh, already uh, uh, coming to Nepal. So they are actually not in official quarantine. So vaccine status is 26% uh, people have got the first dose of vaccine and 21.8% uh, people have been uh, fully vaccinated. So this is also official data. And in my region <clears throat> where I'm living uh, is Banka district. The official data of Banka district is uh, like this. 18,485 people were tested positive until today. And uh, out of, uh, among them, uh, 10,780 male and 7,705 females. So, this is the uh, this is uh, the current uh, statistical status, but uh, the hospital uh, status is uh, now not in tension. Actually, one hundred ten people are in uh, general bed, and ninety people are in ICU, and fifteen people are in uh, ventilator. This is the cap capacity of the hospital, but 21 uh, in general bed, five people are in intensive care unit and three people are in uh, ventilator. That means uh, 29 people only, 29 people are in the hospital now in, uh, in Bakke district. So this is the major government hospital that treats uh, the COVID patients. This is, this is called COVID hospital. So yeah, this is the situation, current situation of COVID. Thanks, Ramesh. Um, and just to be clear, because I, I'm sure this question or this topic will come up later, that 26% that is the total number of people who have any form of protection, either one dose or two doses. It's yes. not it's not 21% plus 26%, it's 26% in total have any form of protection. Yes. Um, and just by comparison in Australia, uh, it's about two thirds, it's about 66% of the population currently have any form, sorry, 66% of the eligible 16 plus population as well for us have um, received at least one dose. Uh, so, and the gap, as you can see, is quite large. 21% 20, um, of people have already received uh, one dose. It's only 26% of the population have received, um, yeah, the second dose. So the, the, the gap is still not great. There's a huge population completely unprotected in Nepal. Um, Ramesh, I was just going to ask, I know it had, I know the disease had a particular impact on you directly, but so what, what's been your experience, your, the personal impact of COVID for you, but also for your family and your church community and the wider community, like what has COVID meant for you? Uh, unexpectedly, I myself 
became the victim. I was infected. Uh, when I was infected at that time, Nepal government had uh, set up a uh, few, only few uh, government isolation centers. These were not well managed. Uh, drinking water was lacking and food, mostly water and food uh, used to be supplied from the patient's home. When I became sick, I had two options one day. First, go to the government hospital and all the supplies uh, uh, come from home. Or choose the paid isolation center, which was very expensive. So, uh, I, I chose the paid one. So I paid 3000 Nepali rupees per day uh, in, the, in the isolation center. So I, I, uh, I was uh, for 14 days there and I spent around 50,000 Nepali rupees for, uh, for only for the isolation center. But fortunately I was, uh, I was uh, insured. Already I was insured. So insurance company paid all my expenses and uh, I, also, it was uh, not very big uh, problem for me. But my family was already in the in the risk, but uh, they didn't have any uh, symptoms or uh, they didn't find any problems, so they were not tested actually. So they might be positive at that time, but they were not tested. But uh, nothing happened. But in our church, there were. Uh, uh, yeah, around uh, around half of the believers were uh, positive, and one church member uh, we lost. So uh, yes, it was it was very difficult for us to handle uh, all these uh, believers having positive and uh, sending them them to the hospital and uh, coping, uh, praying for them, visiting hospitals five six times a day. The first entrance into the hospital during uh, during the second wave, it was uh, it was uh, very difficult for me. I I, I I imagine that the viruses are hovering around my head, and uh, so I, I just wanted to escape from there, but I couldn't. But uh, slowly it became uh, used to for me, and uh, we visited four, five, six times a day. Uh, only uh, with a normal mask, but God protected us uh, from his heavenly uh, protection. So we 10 people, we 10 people from the church, we fully involved uh, taking care of the patient in the hospital. Uh, but after we lost the family member, the, the church member, uh, we were involved in the fu funeral also. We kept the body into the box ourselves. We took the body into the graveyard and we did all the uh, funeral uh, work. After that, we realized we don't, we, we have, we don't uh, want to go out because we don't want to be, put other people in risk. So we were quarantined ourselves for 10 days. We, uh, 10 people uh, got tested after 10 days. We all were negative, negative, and we started again our service. So supplying food from our church, we, uh, we changed our church hall as a kitchen. We cooked food. We supplied food uh, to the hospital for caretakers, patients, and during that time, uh, we were completely involved in the uh, in the treatment uh, procedure, in the taking care of and supporting them, supplying money. Sometimes people didn't have money, so we uh, we gave money for them uh, as much we we could. Some people returned back later, and then that money again went to other other people. So so it was very difficult, challenging for us. Yeah, I mean, that, that's already amazing. And I know you're going to share in a bit more detail what that service in the hospitals and the, the feed, the, the kitchen and so on, what that was like for the church. But just amazing how much the impact both personally uh, on the community in that way, but the church in a very different health context, you know, 
you know, I think a lot of people on this call are aware if you go to hospital in Nepal, you know, food isn't supplied, blankets aren't supplied, you know, you, you are dependent on family members or, or others to support you for a lot of those needs. So to go into hospital for COVID treatment, particularly during those periods where the hospitals were being overwhelmed. Um, uh, can I share some slides? Can we okay. wait just for one sec? Because uh, okay. I want to come back to that, but I just wanted to ask Megan what what because in a very different context, you know, Australia hasn't gone through the same uh, sort of medical. We we kind of are at the moment, in a way, but we haven't gone through the same level of infections or impact at that level. But I was just wondering if Megan could reflect on what COVID has meant for her personally and her family and her church community. Yeah, I'm just actually I'll just show, um, share a screen. She says what happened to Australia to explain also how I understand my own personal experience. Um, so there you go. There's the um, comparison, and you can see that Australia has done really well, and that's been my experience. I haven't had anyone in my church who's had COVID. Um, I've been in a postcode even in Sydney, which has been. Um, had very few cases and very, very high vaccination levels. So 95% um, of the people in my postcode have had at least one dose and into the 80s for full. And that's obviously, so one of my things has been a lot of, I think, thankfulness and wondering why so many people are sort of fighting about what different governments have done in Australia when overall, I think I'm very thankful for our wealth and our good systems and some really tough decisions made with lockdown and, and closed borders. Having said that, of course, the cost we have borne has not been so much deaths, um, but it's been those things like um, lockdowns and closed borders and so on, which have had ripple on effects throughout our communities. Uh, and for me, it's been a couple of ways. Um, one is I've heard a lot of talk about mental health and um, how we need to be concerned about people's mental health in lockdown. But I think often that's been a really simplistic idea that lockdown's bad for mental health, but I think just pandemics are bad for mental health. And I have um, diagnosed anxiety and depression. And uh, it's been more the anxiety over the, the uncertainties and um, difficulties of, of pandemic as a whole that's affected me. So I certainly been, um, I think I've been having an anxiety dream every every day, <laughs> every night. I've been waking that, um, which has just made everything a lot harder. But as I say, I'm not sure there was a way necessarily to prevent that, except for not being in a pandemic. Uh, and then um, just recently, this has really been brought to my mind. Uh, I haven't seen my twin brother who lives in Brisbane because I've closed borders for two years and neither of my parents. And my mum's health is very bad at the moment, not due to COVID, but her heart is close to failing. And of course, she hasn't seen my, my brother for two years. And that's I think brought very personally the difficulties that we've, the, the, the costs that we've paid in Australia. Um, and of course, just really hoping that um, she can get to see him and while she's still alive. So kind of both a, a gratefulness, but obviously still a lot of the strains that other people in Australia have been experiencing as well, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's a significant to hear you reflect on um, the conversation about mental health because it, it has sometimes come across as very one-sided as if lockdowns are the problem and people being locked down is the cause of anxiety or depression or, or thoughts of suicide and self-harm. But yeah, as you say, actually pandemics are anxiety-inducing um, and how do you balance people's genuine needs to engage socially and genuine needs to have time outside and so on with also genuine needs to be safe from a virus that will make many people seriously uh, ill and, and will, will kill some. So it's, yeah, I, I appreciate hearing that. Um, I want to just reflect for a little while, um, and Ramesh, I might ask you to start. Um, Paul in Philippians asks us to reflect on whatever is right and true and beautiful um, 
and I could go back to the verse and find all the all the adjectives. It's it's a it's a verse I probably should memorize um, the actual words Paul uses, but uh, but it is one of those situations where often and Ramesh, you've already given us a bit of it an indication of what it meant for Smyrna Church, where actually the church has been able to be something beautiful um, and true and noble in a really difficult circumstance and so I just wanted to ask you both to reflect on where for you have you seen the church at its best where have you seen the church really bearing witness to the goodness of God in the way it has responded to COVID so Ramesh would love to hear more about um, Smyrna Church but also anything else you've seen in Nepal two things uh... I would like to say uh, before I go to the, the work we have done. First thing, uh, the oxygen supplies was uh, a big problem uh, in the second wave, actually. So most of the hospitals, they, they had oxygen supplies, but very limited. They were not actually prepared for, uh, for uh, the outbreak. So, for three weeks, uh, most of the hospitals, uh, they, they didn't get enough supplies. So because of the lack of oxygen supplies, a lot of patients died. So our experience, so for one of our, uh, our patients, we had brought two oxygen cylinders from INF Bake. And so while filling, while refilling the oxygen uh, in the factory, one of our oxygen cylinder was stolen. So that shows how, uh, how uh, people were uh, looking for uh, the oxygen cylinders. Actually oxygen supply, oxygen factory were, uh, said they have enough oxygen, but they didn't have the cylinders to refill it. So, so, uh, we, so we are happy that one of the patient might have got the oxygen because we lost the, the oxygen cylinder, but, but that was the situation. And uh, even the, uh, the, the hospital people, they didn't know how to, how to uh, make correct supply from the uh, oxygen uh, plant. Because it was the it was the uh, big uh, big crisis and they were themselves hopeless and then it was very difficult for for uh, for making uh, the the good supplies management management was uh, also in problem. The second thing, the pastors in Nepal, most of the uh, pastors in Nepal became sick nationwide. Because the pastors were the front liner, front liners uh, for church believers, actually. So uh, most of the pastors became sick, and then uh, in the in the uh, in the uh, beginning they didn't realize they were sick. So when they became uh, the uh, they be, they had symptoms, then they went to the hospital, and uh, many pastors we lost. Even the big pastors in Kathmandu, uh, some fam some pastors' family, they lost two, three people within the family. So in Banke and Bardia, uh, also the number of pastors died. So this was a uh, big, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of pastors. And uh, I would like to share some uh, some of the activities we could uh, we could do, do uh, to address uh, uh, the crisis. Okay, the, the first thing uh, we did is uh, we uh, supported uh, health 
materials to the local health posts. Uh, actually, in our working area, there were six health posts. So, so six health posts and isolation centers run by them uh, were supported by health materials. Uh, and uh, so that uh, uh, isolation centers were uh, equipped uh, to deal with the COVID crisis. And second thing, so we had to go to hospital a lot during this uh, pandemic, second wave actually. So, so this happened sometimes five, six times a day, sometimes during night, sometimes a day, this happened a lot, supporting uh, people, counseling people, giving money, supplying food and uh, a lot of things. So the church was converted into kitchen, small kitchen, and we cooked food there and church volunteers used to carry food packages on their motorbikes and uh, they take uh, these packets to the hospital. So we distributed food packages. So this uh, contained rice, lentils, cooking well, salt, uh, some dry, dry vegetables, uh, hand was shop like that. So, so we, we did this uh, uh, for five times. It depended different numbers in different places, but so we, we distributed uh, food supplies to very poor families. And third one, uh, we realized that the COVID winners, after the treatment, they went back to, the, to, to their home, but they didn't have enough nutrition. So we uh, handed over uh, nutrition packets to the COVID, so let's, the, for COVID winners. So we distributed uh, nutrition to them. And the uh, third one, we uh, uh, distributed masks to the general publics in the bus parks, markets, around hospitals, Nepal, uh, India borders, where people used to go, or go and then in the community, uh, to each families, we, we distributed 50 masks for a family, a packet of masks. So uh, 20, 25,000 masks we distributed all together during this time. And we also supported treatment costs to very poor families. So from my personal uh, requests, so many friends gave money for that. I had one lakh Nepali rupees that was given uh, uh, by the insurance com company uh, because I was COVID patient. So that money and other people, so many friends uh, gave money for that. So altogether, 75 people were supported. And uh, some were given 5,000 Nepali rupees, 10,000, 15,000, and uh, to uh, very few people, we gave 20,000 Nepali rupees for, for treatment. And that was great support for them. And uh, the families who have lost the key person, bread earning person uh, in the family, and if they are poor and they want to do something for income generation, then we have supported income generation support to them also. So, that is 20,000 Nepali rupees we gave for a family uh, and uh, five or six families, they have started income generation uh, activities. So because of this work, uh, Milab was awarded from uh, very hospital, Janaki uh, rural municipality where we um, we run our community development project and a district uh, COVID coordination and management committee. So they uh, 
they awarded Mila. So uh, this is what, what we did uh, during the second wave. So these uh, activities, uh, actually uh, church was very closely involved uh, with Mila because Mila is an organization which runs social activities initiated by the church. So Mila and church is very closely coordinated and uh, uh, Smarna Church also gave money for uh, these activities and church volunteers were in, involved and church was very closely involved with Mila for these activities. Wow, that's so wonderful to see. And it, I, I mean, I hadn't seen all of those photos before, but even having known the work that you were doing, just seeing those again, just bring such joy. And the recognition that the hospital and the municipality uh, and local authorities have shown, the appreciation that they've shown, just is such, I mean, you've already started answering the question about what are the missiological issues around COVID. Um, here's a church, a local church responding in these ways. Um, and it, it was a real privilege uh, for me and for us in INF Australia to to be working with you and supporting the work that you did. It was just stunning. And to turn, you know, to turn a church into a kitchen for those weeks to feed people in the hospital and, and provide food. Just beautiful. Thanks, Ramesh. <laughs> How about you, Megan? I, I suspect in Australia we're going to have slightly less powerful and dramatic stories, but what what where have you seen the church at its best responding to COVID? So probably I would say uh, local and global responses. Um, I'm not on the pastoral team of my church, so I'm going to say something they've done good, but I'm I'm in academia now, so not uh, boasting on my own, own behalf. But um, Baptist churches have a, a policy of um, every month at communion, taking up an offering that we put into a fund for our community. So we're known to keep that there. And so, of course, that's gone to help people during COVID. Um, and the denomination, and certainly in New South Wales, sent out a, a letter to pastors saying, if you run out of that, um, turn to us and we'll start using denominational funds. Um, now, that's often kept quite quiet, but I do know that it's been being used. Um, and one, one reason I know it's being used, because a friend of mine who was out of work and in fact, because I was using the money from the church to go and do his grocery shopping because I was ahead of him on vaccination. <laughs> so I was doing that because obviously it was less dangerous for me to go um, into the supermarket than, than for him. Um, and I know that the church, which the church that I'm part of has had a, a real history of being very present for its community. Um, so a lot of people did turn. So we've actually had an increase of people coming to church um, during both lockdowns, I think, <laughs> um, because of being there for people, not just financially, but emotionally. Uh, and then I want to share, so I think, I think it's been, I mean, the needs have been different, but the church has still in the same way, I think, reacted to the community need around it. Um, but of course, also recognising that, um, I was going to share my screen, that it's not just um, local, but also um, global. And one of the things that I, I had a very small um, part in, but uh, was spearheaded, I think. So it wasn't just a Christian campaign, but it was spearheaded by a Christian um, organisation, Micro Australia, called End COVID For All. And it was supported by a lot of Christian organisations and leaders, but beyond that, um, politicians and celebrities and so on, a whole lot of organisations got behind this thing to ask for our government um, to put money into globally ending COVID, so COVID tests, vaccines, treatment. And that was something like the fact that that was initiated, I think, by a Christian organisation was, I think, really um, powerful. Yeah. So that I think was a witness perhaps going against some of the other stuff that was happening, which we'll talk about in a second. Yeah, that that's that's really good. Uh, and I think it's one of those it's one of those situations where people I think do just genuinely get a sense of what when we talk about the love of God or the goodness of God, 
Um, this gives people a chance to feel it, to experience what we mean by that, and that that there is something behind those words uh, when churches are able to respond in that sort of way. Um, now that's beautiful. So I do I do want to talk about what are because there's not every church has responded in these ways. Um, but I don't want to just focus on the, the kind of challenging issues. But COVID is definitely raising a lot of challenging issues. It raises some questions on about faith. I, I straight away, you know, uh, a few friends I interact with on Facebook, and one of them uh, straight away, uh, uh, well, what, wanted to have a de- wanted to have a debate about a range of things, including, you know how can you believe in a God when look now there's a global pandemic um, and you know I pointed out to him well look there have been pandemics before there have been earthquakes there have been you know every every time and place has a reason for people to question the goodness or the even the existence of God it's not like that's not a new thing and Christians have always wrestled with how is God at work in the world? What is God doing now? How is God present with us? Um, we, the conversation didn't go very far because he's not that interested. Like, you know, like a lot of people, he just wanted to make a snarky point. You know, how can you trust God when he, there's a global pandemic? He doesn't really want to actually talk about, well, the God I worship isn't the God who sends pandemics to, to hurt people. He's the God who takes the form of a human being who enters into the experience, including the suffering of others, and who takes that suffering onto himself in order to liberate us from sin, from death, from bondage, um, and the hope of a resurrection life in which all of these evils are defeated, all of these um, things that that aren't the way they are in heaven. Um, but yeah, but it but it's genuinely raised some challenging questions because I know. Churches in Nepal and in Australia have been closed um, for, for in-person meetings. Uh, and a lot of people have pointed to, you know, verse from Hebrews 10, you know, don't give up meeting with one another. It's, a, it's an instruction in scripture. So were we, were we disobeying God when we, when we decided not to meet? And those churches who decided to ignore the rules and meet together and sing together, were they doing the right thing? Um, were we... By, by locking down in those ways, were we rendering to Caesar, were we rendering to the government something which should only have been rendered to God, that is obedience and, and kind of worship and a commitment to community? Um, people have asked whether, uh, I mean, and there are extreme ends of this, you know, people saying, you know, God gave us our immune systems. So to take a vaccine is to not, is to say, I don't trust God to protect me. I, I am um, um, per- personally of the opinion that God gave us minds and, and so on. And rather than, yeah, anyway, we, we can cover this. But look, it's raised a lot of issues about personal freedom and rights, corporate responsibilities and what the balancing act of those is, how much the church should bear a distinctive ethos in the way it operates, and how much it should align itself with government, public health orders, and, and kind of other mandates. What, what do you think are the big, and that's quite apart from those big questions of how do we understand the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God in the context of a global pandemic that's still ongoing. It's killed probably 15 million people. It will go on to kill many more. It will kill the poorest people first as so many disasters do, it will affect the most vulnerable in terms of their health, the most vulnerable in terms of their economic situation, those who can't avoid exposure to the virus, who can't afford not to work, um, who live in the most difficult situations, who have the least access to health. We know all of this. We'll see it in Australia as we see it around the world. What for you are the big theological issues or the big missiological issues that come up? And how would you respond to some of those you know, people who don't want to get vaccinated because it, they think it feels like not trusting God or are offended that we're wearing masks because, as the signs say in some of these demonstrations, you know, Jesus is their vaccine. Uh, 
yeah, how should we think and feel and what should we do in response to this? And uh, sorry, that's a, a long rambling set of questions. So feel free to pick and choose from what I've asked. But have you had encounters with people like that? And what have you said and done in response to those in those conversations? So Megan, how, how about you? Yeah, it's been a, a, a major um, struggle, I think, for the Church of Australia, which in a lot of ways pretty much has things very easy and has had to confront some difficult questions that perhaps we haven't had to deal with before. And that's a, a growing experience. I, I actually think that there's a lot of quite noisy voices, but overall the, um, the denominations have been um, and leaders have been really uh, in, stressing compliance and vaccination and so on. Um, however, yeah, there's been some questions about uh, meeting together, how important that is, or should we be three to do that? Uh, and also, um, as you're saying, things like vaccination. To do with the meeting together, I think what's really intrigued me with that is the underlying view of God that, for me, the Hebrews passage that you mentioned is about what is good for us and um, and that we encourage each other as we meet together. But also interestingly, it's a passage which says when two or three, you know, um, are meeting. And um, obviously if you're in a household, you've still been doing that. I've been watching and, and participating in church with my, my family household. Um, and you've been doing that online, which I think is a bit similar to Paul and the letters that he was sent out. It's just a, a different um, technology. But also he was often prevented, as we know, from being with people face to face, but he still found ways around that. And I think it's instead of seeing it as God requires us to meet together, but rather God has care for us and for other people. And so in, if we look at it that way, the question then becomes, in this particular circumstance, what's the wisest and the most caring thing to do, um, particularly of those people who can least care for or protect themselves? Um, and so that's really, I think, brought out to me, I think maybe some more work that needs to be done on, on what the church is about and why we do what we do, because it seems to me that it's been, the understanding that I've heard has been quite about mm -hmm. fulfilling law, which is really odd <laughs> coming from some sections of the church, I think, and, um, and a, a better understanding of um, the church as representing Christ would be helpful as well, rather than that we just go to do things for ourselves, but but how do we fulfil our mission in these particular circumstances, I think would have been a better question. So there's that. Um, the vaccination thing, I think, I think mostly, and we're looking at the numbers in Australia, very high vaccination because we've got access, but also I think Christians obviously are being vaccinated. Um, it's just sort of, I think, again, shows that we haven't had to think through some issues because our lives are quite comfortable and uh, but yeah you know, most Christians I know would use seat belts they would use modern medicine they would do all sorts of things to uh, take wise care of themselves and others and this is an, another example so I feel like with that one it's been quite there's been a couple of things going on it's been quite politicized and um, and also I think there's been a lot of misinformation and I think that's something where, as Christians, we have to understand that truth is really important and humility in that we don't um, expect that all of us have all the knowledge, but rather that um, God gave humankind to each other so that we may um, depend on each other and learn from each other. And one of the ways is really looking to the knowledge of those people given to us who have the expertise, um, who've been saying, get vaccinated. Uh, so yes, I think that one's been muddied and I think perhaps one of the things we'll have to do coming out of this is say, why have we allowed the church to be a place where misinformation is spread and why have we allowed the church to become politicised? I think they're going to be very crucial questions. Yeah, a lot to reflect on in that. Um, I'm going to follow up in a moment as well, but Ramesh, what, what does it look like in Nepal? How how are Christians thinking about um, COVID and responding to COVID? Are most churches like Smyrna Church, act, kind of trying whatever they can do in their context to keep each other safe and to care for the community? 
is there any debate about masks and vaccines and and so on How, what does it look like in nepal for for christians vaccines in my understanding and experience vaccines are well accepted i haven't seen uh, or heard uh, any uh, different views than accepting uh, vaccines they don't have different ideas uh, in general uh, all nepalese want to get vaccinated but we don't have that much uh, uh, vaccines at let's let's hope we'll get but uh, so in uh, vaccination centers i have seen a long queue waiting for their uh, turns uh, to get vaccines that shows uh, normally people uh, don't have any oppositions uh, wearing masks uh, getting vaccines uh, are easy easy accepted but the problem is uh, they don't uh, in uh, regarding uh, regarding masks so in the towns uh, there are a lot of people uh, seen without wearing masks the problem is most of the poor people they can't afford so 5 rupees uh, if uh, 2 rupees masks are sold in 10 rupees in the market so if you buy in wholesale you'll get 50 pieces mask in uh, in 75 rupees but so if you want one of one piece then they they charge 10 rupees so 10 rupees is big money for uh, so many people so the people wearing masks are seen uh, wearing dirty masks 3 4 5 days long they are wearing they are wearing a mask and there are many people they are not wearing masks so yes uh, they don't have problem wearing masks but still seen a lot of people not wearing so because of that reason we tried to supply uh, as much as possible masks so still we want uh, to distribute masks to the to the rickshaw pullers uh, general like uh, day workers and rickshaw pullers, even the students in the government schools. So they are going to the, to the school, but they don't have masks. So we try to reach school students as well. So yes, this is the situation, but vaccines, we are waiting for more uh, vaccine, doses of vaccines, but we don't have. Let's pray for that. Yeah. The, it's interesting, the reflection from both of you, those images from some of the protests in Australia with people, you know, bearing Christian signs of some kind, you know, Jesus, the blood of Jesus is my vaccine, but, you know, aggressively, you know, very aggressively anti-mask or anti-lockdown or anti-vaccine that I think what I'm hearing from both of you is in your experience and observation, it's a very tiny minority um, maybe it's a much larger majority uh, minority in somewhere like the United States, but um, but it's so and it's obviously something the media wants to focus on because it's visually quite dramatic. It it's got its own inbuilt story about superstition and religion and right, you know the right wing. So there's lots in that, but it's good to hear that that's not how it really plays out in most church communities. Um, I'm going to open up for questions. So just flag for people that if you've got questions or comments. Um, one, one thing I would like to uh, add uh, regarding vaccine. So a lot of Nepali pastors, they have posted uh, their fax, vaccine cards mm -hmm. on the Facebook, appealing uh, Christians to receive uh, vaccines uh if they have 
uh, opportunity. So, so these appeals with their vaccine cards uh, suggests mm. uh, general believers mm. to accept vaccines uh, without any hesitations. I mean, we've seen the same thing in Australia, I think, lots and lots of pastors in particular, um, even those who have are perhaps more conservative, have been putting up pictures of themselves with their sleeve rolled up getting the vaccine. So there has been a great push, I think. And actually in the US, I'm told that um, it's something like 85% of US evangelical pastors have been vaccinated. <laughs> it's their congregations that haven't been rather than the pastors themselves. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that and that sort of public leadership and community leadership within their communities is really really important. I mean, can't can't force people, but it, it's encouraging to hear when people do make that uh, a personal witness, so to speak. Um, I'm interested. Megan raised the the Micah Australia um, campaigner and then COVID for all, and it's come up a few times the inequities around vaccine access. So Australia. You know, uh, we've heard how how much that has improved for us lately, and that's largely improved because of the buying power of the Australian government, um, our ability to negotiate deals directly with pharmaceutical companies who produce vaccines, or with other countries who either have some spare or are persuaded to make some available um, at at a price, uh, in a way that poor countries like Nepal can't do, and Nepal would be ahead of many other low-income countries. Uh, there are at least a dozen countries in Africa where the fewer than 1% of the population, less than 1% of the population has been, you know, received any vaccinations. So it's a vast inequity at a global level. Um, yeah, and for me, that's, that, that's kind of one of the big challenges of Christians, not just demonstrating in their own communities, in their own congregations that are largely made up of people like them, you know, the same socioeconomic status, because that's how churches form in, in our neighbourhoods. But um, how do we demonstrate that actually we have a concern for global justice and equity, that, uh, that a situation where vaccines are available to the countries with the most money and the best lawyers isn't it, it, it just not in any way uh, an, an okay way to proceed through uh, a pandemic, which, um, now I forget which body pointed this out, but this will be the first pandemic in human history um, where more people have died after the invention of a safe and effective vaccine than before the invention of the safe and effective vaccine. And most of those deaths will be in poorer communities and in poorer countries. And the, and the arrangements we have for producing and distributing the vaccines rely entirely on pharmaceutical companies producing them and selling them at whatever price they choose. Um, and a vastly underfunded, largely voluntary mechanism called COVAX, not a bad idea in, in principle, but in practice, not delivering at the scale and the speed required to end COVID quickly. Yeah, so I'm interested in, in what, what Christians should do in response to that. How can we speak about that? What can we work on together? Um, so I'm just going to put that to both of you. How can we work together for vaccine equity in access and distribution? And then um, Brian, oh, I just want to note, Bruce has said it was really encouraging to hear what um, Smyrna has done, and thank you for sharing, Ramesh. And Brian has asked as well, are other faith communities, particularly Hindu, um, the, you know, the majority religion in uh, Nepal, is there a Hindu response? How, how, do, how do other faith communities, religious communities particularly, how do Hindus respond to COVID? Are there any concerns around vaccination? I might be adding words to Brian's question, but, you know, does the wider, does the Nepali Christian response look the same as the wider Nepali community response? Or are there distinct differences between the ways Christians are responding, the majority Hindu community is responding, Muslims might be responding differently again? What's your experience there? Uh, yes. So, uh, 
regarding vaccines, they don't have any questions. They have they, they are accepting uh, very easily. But uh, regarding response, uh, Muslims are more uh, more active. I have found Muslims are more active than Hindus. Individual uh, Hindu people individually they are supporting a lot, giving money and uh, uh, yeah, supporting uh, for uh, hospital supplies or other things. But as a group, like as an uh, as a religious uh, structure, I have seen very less responses done by Hindu groups. Sikhs. Uh, Muslims, they are more active than Hindus in a collective way. But individually, yeah, there are so many people have helped in different ways. And do either of you have thoughts about how, how should Christians think about the inequities in access to vaccines, access to treatments, exposure to the virus in the first place. How should we think about that? And, and you know, what do you think we can or could do in response? Um, if, if you mind if I go first, actually, people can bear with me. I was just going to share a screen that gives a plug to my podcast. Um, because we have mentioned this in an upcoming episode, um so so we actually um that was one of the questions that we wanted to talk to we had professor gregory fox come on this week and we talked to him and that's coming out 21st of october on my podcast with all due respect and he's an epidemiologist and um respiratory physician physician um, but also he hasn't been involved with australia's covid response very much he's been involved with vietnam's um covid response so that's, this is something he's been actually on the ground with. Uh, so we did actually want to talk to him about that. And one of the things that came out for me from that particularly was, um, you know, I've been really pro Australia getting very high um, first vaccination up because that affects the vulnerable in many ways in our own communities. However, there is a question over boosters uh, because should we allow um, or we should we encourage our uh, wealthy countries to get a booster across all of their population when many countries in the world don't even have the first level of protection yet from vaccines. And I think that's going to be something perhaps that Christians are going to need to speak strongly about because I suspect there's going to be a big push on our government um, and other countries like us to get boosters out to everybody. And I think we need to hear that perhaps only the most vulnerable in our countries should get boosters while we try and bring the rest of the world up to speed. And that's to our own advantage as well, because um, new variants appear because of the unvaccinated. And so we could get a variant worse than Delta purely because we haven't made um, a priority of getting the whole world vaccinated. So, um, but that's one of the things we talk about with um, Professor Fox, so yeah. Thanks, Megan. That's that's good. Um, Ramesh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about the disparities between wealthy nations and poorer nations, and even you know within a nation between wealthier communities and poorer communities, and how Christians should feel and respond. I'm not sure if you're maybe you don't have it maybe you don't have something to say or maybe <laughs> no oh, it's fine uh Bruce has said thanks Megan for raising this we need to push vaccinating the world before boosters so I think I think that's a really good insight so I encourage everyone to go to the with all due respect podcast which I guess you can find wherever you find your podcasts um or the eternity news website i'm sure you can find the links there as well but it like it is a great it's a great podcast a, a conversation between megan and a, an anglican minister uh michael jensen um on a whole range of of 
kind of social issues, church, you know, and Christian faith issues, um, as you guess from the title, are genuinely engaged, respectful, insightful conversation, and obviously a really, really topical guest for your upcoming uh, issue. So I look forward to that one. Um, the, yeah, I uh, just want to flag as well, this is something that I think people should get active about because it is go it is happening. Uh, it's not just going to happen. It's already happening. Um, it's happening in the UK. It's happening in Australia. Conversations about when boosters will be available. These conversations are happening at a government level um, and they will proceed. How that happens, what influence we can have, we need to get active and organised uh, urgently and speak out about it um, to try to flag and, and bring others along. So I just want to flag something that INF Australia did um, recently. And in the light of this conversation, we'll have to think, well, what more, what next steps, next actions can we take? But people might be aware or might not that uh, inside the World Trade Organization, there are rules around the sharing of intellectual property. Um, and so if, if, a, if a patent is held on a, on a particular piece of medical technology, like a vaccine or a treatment or a piece of equipment, that piece of equipment obviously can't just be um, made by somebody else, made in a generic form. There's quite strong intellectual property rights protection built into the World Trade Organization agreements. Uh, and inside the council that considers those matters, uh, in it might have been a year ago now, actually, I think it was October 2020, India and South Africa put a proposal to temporarily suspend the application of those rules to allow for uh, production and distribution of critical uh, vaccines, treatments and equipment related to overcoming the, the COVID, the coronavirus, the COVID pandemic. Uh, <clears throat> and that proposal, uh, because the World Trade Organization uh, operates on a consensus basis, couldn't go forward unless all the parties agreed to allow it to go forward. And for quite some period, Australia was one of the holdout countries. Primarily the countries who resisted were wealthy, Many of them were countries with very strong pharmaceutical industries based in their countries. Um, Australia, a little bit of both. We don't have a huge pharmaceutical industry, but uh, the, the US government, um, for example, agreed to stop blocking that proposal before the Australian government did. So we actually worked together with, um, I think we got, um, well, certainly more than a dozen. I think we got about six, 15 or 16 Nepalese Australian community organisations, but about a dozen other NGOs, Australian primarily aid NGOs. We coordinated an open let or a letter. We shared it with the Prime Minister, the Trade Minister and the Foreign Minister. We organised a round of phone calls to the Trade Minister, particularly around the World Trade Organisation meetings. We weren't alone in doing this. I know that Amnesty International, uh, AFTINET, an advocacy group on trade and investment, were active on this as well. But uh, the end result was, at least rhetorically, the trade minister has now said in public that Australia won't oppose that, um, that uh, submission from India and South Africa. The next step is making sure that it's easy enough to say you won't oppose a thing, but then not actually do anything to help make it happen. Um, and there's lots of technical issues. You know, just making the waiver happen doesn't mean that the vaccines get made and get distributed. There are more steps after that, but it's a significant barrier. So uh, I'll, I'll put up a website in a moment, but it is something that we have been organised on and want to keep being organised on. But I do encourage people as you learn about these issues, do try to find ways where you can speak because sometimes we can help in really practical ways. We can visit a hospital. We can sit alongside someone who's stuff suffering or struggling. We can be present for people. Sometimes we can help financially because we've got resources that we can share that other people can put to use in, in really frontline direct situations. And we've seen how what that has looked like because we couldn't have supported um, the work of Smyrna, uh, sorry, of Millup um, 
and the other organisations, INF Nepal, um, in a way that we did without the support from people in the Australian community. But the other thing that, that we all have is we do have a voice. We have the capacity to speak out. It's not always a loud voice. It's not always an influential voice, but staying silent certainly doesn't change anything. So if you find something where you think, I can raise this with my local politician, or I'm happy to put a call in to the trade minister and just say, thanks, you did a good thing, now act on it. Um, that's actually a really nice call to make, to be able to call a politician and say, thanks for what you said, really looking forward to seeing you take action on you know, putting those words into practice. So I'm just gonna flick up uh, for one moment my screen and then just have a look at the last few uh, if there are any more questions yeah so i just did my very brief summary of things that i think uh, as church we can do to continue to be church through covid uh, i think getting vaccinated is a thing that if you can do you should do because it is a way of sharing your, you know, reducing the risk that you will be a vector for the for the disease to people who will be harmed by it. It obviously provides a level of protection for you, but um, yeah, just encourage anyone who's not sure, uh, hasn't yet done it, please, I think it's a great thing to do. Yeah, I think Megan's um, reflections about mental health, but not, not just mental health, you know, emotional equilibrium, social, um, you know, the difficulty of, of living through lockdown, a sense of motivation when, you know, when we're struggling with work from home for months and months at a time uh, in here in Sydney anyway, uh, just being present for people, emotionally present. So it, for me, it's just one of those many striking things that Paul says of mourning with those who mourn and rejoicing with those who rejoice, just being present in sadness, in praise and thankfulness um, for people. Uh, the next page is where you can see what INF did about that uh, global uh, vaccine equity issue, and you can find kind of where we're up to there. There is a chance to follow up on that, so I do encourage you to go there. And obviously I'm gonna plug INF as a great place to support for the work um, in responding to COVID. But we are by no stretch of the imagination the only organisation doing this kind of work in these kinds of communities. I love INF. I love the work that uh, INF Australia gets to do and the work of our partners like Milap is amazing. But whoever you're supporting, please just do it wholeheartedly and as generously as you are able um, because it's when we work together and share, um, that, yeah, and particularly share prayerfully that God puts those resources um, to work. Um, so let me stop sharing that, check if there are any other questions, and then because we're pretty much right on the time, maybe slightly over. Yeah, so... Um, hey ben, can I ask a que quick question oh, to remit? Yeah. Absolutely. So rather than writing it. Um, no, it's good. And in, in this last phase, if anyone else wants to, you know, turn on their mic and turn on their camera to ask a question, please do feel free. Thanks, Ramesh. I'm interested from your perspective. I mean, it seems to me the two really big challenges for the Nepali church um, after post-COVID has been, one, the loss of the number of leaders, as you mentioned, um, but secondly, then just the support of pastors, particularly, you know, with the economic situation, uh, less meeting, you know, so many pastors aren't getting supported, particularly in smaller churches. How do you see the best way that people can support or how to um, engage with the Nepali church to help it through this? What, what do you think is the way forward for the Nepali church in the face of these challenges? Uh, in most of the most of the churches in the villages, uh, I have seen pastors' wife are taking the responsibility of the uh, remaining church now. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the bigger churches like in Kathmandu or in Pokhara, uh, 
the bigger churches, they have uh, other uh, leaders as well to look after the church after the uh, senior senior pastor's death. But in the villages, uh, the the son or the or the wife of the pastors, they are taking care. Like <clears throat> two weeks ago, I had visited two uh, two families of the pastors. Uh, both pastors died, and uh, I went to visit them. So, uh, in both places, pastors' wife are taking uh, the responsibility. And uh, for the, for those families, we have supported for income generation uh, activities. Uh, like one family said, they can they can uh, uh, start pig. Uh, pig farm, small pig farm, and uh, we uh, help them to buy piglets. So uh, it has been two weeks. And one family, uh, they see, uh, see, she wanted to start a, a goat, a small goat farm. So we, we helped her uh, to buy uh, goats. So, so everywhere, uh, the key person, if the key person is, is uh, lost, then uh, they have uh, uh, psychological uh, lacking, uh, financial lacking, and uh, the key leaders is gone in the church, then there will be, yeah, obviously there will be problem, but yes, they are, they are doing somehow their best. That is what I found. Right. So, and, and that's good that you can yeah, give some support in the ways that you have already. Thank you for that. Financial, financial support and uh, psychological uh, support is uh, very important for these families. Hmm. I, I suppose it certainly highlights just the need to continue to develop Nepali leadership, church leadership. I mean, yes. there's, and there's, there's more, there's opportunities now. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Last chance for questions or comments. Oh. Meryl's got a question. <laughs> I was making a comment, really. It just uh, thank you very much. This has been very helpful to have the practical um, outworking of what's happening in, in the areas like Ramesh has been able to say, and it's helpful to have Megan as well to um, reflect on what's happening here in Australia and to sort of think through some of those things ourselves and the need to advocate for the worldwide e equitable um, vaccines I think it's so important so thank you very much it's been very helpful all of you yeah absolutely seconded um really really encouraging insightful stimulating conversation thanks for sharing thanks for sharing personally both of you and and so reflectively uh, about kind of issues and responses really appreciate it Thanks to everyone on the call uh, for interest in INF and our work, but interest in this topic. And yeah, I just guess I encourage you because I think the topic of the conversation, that's, that's us for the next however many years. Mm -hmm. We are called to be church through COVID. Um, and I just encourage you to continue to reflect on that, what it means to be uh, church to be God's people, um, reflecting on, responding to, and reflecting outwards the goodness uh, and grace of God. So I'm going to bid everyone a good night. This recording will be online uh, in the not too distant future, and we'll send out an email to you so you can share it with others who might not have been able to join the call. Thanks, Ramesh. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you all.